Did you know that Chicago has its very own island in the heart of the city? That's right. Goose Island is a mysterious post-industrial region distinguished by its abandoned bridge, forgotten railroad tracks, and cursed ground pollution. And although most Chicagoans have certainly transited this area, many don't even realize that it is in fact an island, a notion that has existed in the city for generations, as suggested by the Chicago Tribune's article from 1886, which stated, quote, for without Goose Island, Chicago would never have seen a Sweeney or O'Malley. Most Chicagoans have but a dim conception of what Goose Island is and has been, and probably not 1% of the inhabitants, even of the north side, know where it is. So my question is, how did an island that most people don't even know exists so aggressively transform the city culturally and industrially, and what remains of it now? Today we discover Goose Island, I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. First, we need to establish that the Goose Island of today is man-made. There was, however, at one time, a smaller natural island that was, let's say, destroyed by man. This is Chicago's lost Goose Island. You see, when Chicago was a very young city, a small natural island located at the junction of the north and south branches of the Chicago River served no purpose aside from hosting geese owned by the people living along the riverbanks. In fact, back then, on a sunny day, the island would be covered entirely by birds, hence the name. This original island was said to be a mound of yellow clay and was at best 20 square yards depending on the level of the river water. In the spring, the island would disappear entirely below the murky water. By the 1840s, the surrounding area, sometimes called the Patch, welcomed groups of immigrants from Ireland escaping the potato famine. They began squatting on the land that would later become Kenzie Street between Orleans and the river, calling their rustic outpost Kilgabin, which soon grew to become a shantytown filled with German, Irish, and Italian immigrants who were said to have dealt with lives of crime and prostitution. This trend would continue in the area for several generations. The story of the Irish immigrants in particular is fascinating. The very first batch of Irish immigrants started their journey in America against some pretty unusual odds. As according to the Chicago Tribune article from 1886, those from Cork were the evicted tenants of Lord Milton, the Earl of Kenmar, and the Marquis of Lansdowne, latter of which became Governor General of Canada. These evictees were known back then as, quote, assisted immigrants. In other words, the landlords bought them passage to America to get them out of Ireland so that they could avoid tax liabilities of supporting the poorhouses after eviction. These immigrants made passage via the Tapscots line and were basically dumped at the port of New York with ganty clothing and no money whatsoever. And although I couldn't find the entire context here, it was noted that a Western Railroad contractor brought a shipload of these, quote, assisted immigrants to Chicago, where they settled on a small strip of land between Kenzie, Franklin, and the river's north branch. Evidence suggests that the men later worked for the railroads and the city sewer system. So this most likely came down to the need for cheap labor. People lived in absolute squalor, a reporter from the original Chicago Times recalled, quote, This is one of the patches where the sons of Emerald Isle have squatted, built their seven by nine shanties, reared their offspring, and bred their extensive droves of geese, hens, cows, dogs, and cats. So as this rabid shanty town grew, the immigrants continued settling closer and closer to the riverbank until ultimately they found themselves on what later became Goose Island proper. The settlers were joined by Polish and German immigrants who only enhanced the rural feel of this urban outpost by raising livestock in the area and working in nearby factories. At its peak, Kilgobin had over 100 units of housing in a three block area with taverns and bars to complete the picture. Although the immigrants here were hardworking, their circumstances reduced them to the lowest levels of society. The Chicago Tribune reads, The circumstances under which they lived in the old country and were basically imported were not conducive to their progress. 
They had been kept ignorant according to the law. They had been robbed according to the law. They had been dropped from their native land according to the law. So they naturally had little respect for the law. And Kilgobbin afterwards, known as Goose Island, was often the scene of lawless episodes. Other social issues were also manifesting as railroads began running lines directly through sections of this squat land, resulting in frequent accidents. A culminating point was reached when a boy named Higgins, the son of a prominent Goose Islander, was run over and fatally injured. Despite turbulence with the people, some who were already American voters, the city sided with the railroads, and Mayor Long John decided to, quote, clean out the squatters pushing them and their geese just north of the Halstead Street Bridge where the river forms an arc of a circle with the convex side towards the southwest. However, as you'll see in the coming chapter, the part of Goose Island where Kilgobbin was would be taken down the same way Caprini Green was demolished out of existence. Remember that yellow clay I mentioned earlier? Well, the original island where Irish immigrants settled had been dredged away by 1865 for that very raw material it sat upon, enabling the city to do away with the slums and profit simultaneously. Goose Island was about to industrialize. In 1853, Chicago's first mayor, William B. Ogden, formed the City Land Company and purchased land on the east side of the river to use as a source of clay for brickmaking. Workers excavated a channel northward, and by 1857, the channel had rejoined the river, forming a shortcut past the riverbend. This new channel was 50 feet wide by 10 feet deep, meaning that a ship could pass. And so it was. The North Branch Canal, or Ogden's Channel, was formed, and now a much more substantial version of Goose Island was born. Unlike the original and much smaller island where birds lived, the city now had a unique 160-acre area with a length of 1.5 miles and a width of about a half mile. At the time, locals nicknamed it Ogden's Island, which for many years stuck in the minds of Chicagoans in the same way that we think of Willis Tower as the Sears Tower. Actually, by 1891, some of the city's aldermen went as far as proposing the name be made official. Forming an island in the heart of a growing town presented exciting opportunities and challenges. Still, the area would ultimately become a mecca of logistics, meaning that Goose Island would play a critical role in the trajectory of Chicago. As soon as the new canal was formed, an even more fabulous version of Goose Island was created. Docks were laid along the bank, utilized by coal companies, lumber dealers, tan bark dealers, tannery owners, quarrymen, and so on. The tracks above the Milwaukee and St. Paul covered a significant portion of the land with projected growth as the railroad company purchased about 50 acres for $400,000. Grain elevators were set up and plans were made for additional warehouses. In fact, in the late 19th century, these facilities were described as world class. But along with them, the island's original inhabitants inevitably disappeared. But it should be noted that they also benefited from all the new opportunities. You see, about 300 so-called Chicago Islanders held out. Though they were Irish families with a business interest in the area or political influence. By this time, they lived in framed cottages and stayed for the convenience of proximity to their interest. But it wasn't perfect. The island had a limited sewage infrastructure and no other consistent utilities. So by 1886, despite a rapidly falling crime rate in the area, it was a well-accepted notion that Goose Island would have zero inhabitants by the decade's end. Curiously, in two generations, a sense of local identity had formed. Irishmen, who arrived in rags but later made their way into business success, saw themselves as islanders and refer to themselves as such. And yes, with all these changes, these success stories stand out, but there were also those unprepared for change, which is a serious reminder to prepare for life's challenges. And these days, we can do so with a good life insurance policy. Our sponsor, Policy Genius, gives you a smarter way to find and buy the right coverage for you and your family. As a proud father and husband, I've had a policy for years, and Policy Genius helped me confirm that it was the best choice. 
You see, Policy Genius was built to modernize the life insurance industry. Their technology makes comparing quotes from top companies like AIG and Prudential easy in just a few clicks. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $39 per month for $2 million of coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Their licensed agents are not incentivized to recommend one insurer over another, so you can trust their guidance. There are no additional fees and your personal information is private. No wonder they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net. You deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. So head to policygenius.com slash its history or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you can save. At the end of the 19th century, industrialization took hold of the area when the People's Gas, Light and Coke Company purchased land just east of the river to establish their industrial plant. The company distributed a product known as water gas, a fuel gas mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. They achieved this product by blowing hot steam over coke. Ultimately, the company would grow to supply nearly a million Chicago residential, commercial, and industrial customers. With 1,500 employees and 4,300 miles of natural gas mains in Chicago and the surrounding suburbs, the actual fuel manufacturing within Chicago would become obsolete in 1931 when Chicago was connected with Texas via America's Natural Gas Pipeline Company, a 980-mile natural gas pipeline. When the plant was finally closed, the three-acre area of Willow Street Station was contaminated with byproducts such as tar, oils, sludges, and other acidic waste. These spills and leaks contaminated soil and groundwater. But to be fair, it should also be pointed out that the area was so heavily industrialized that there were many additional contributors to this issue. And as is the case with many now post-industrial cities, such as Chicago, cleanup efforts are ongoing. The plant was a big deal for the area of Goose Island, as the company had always been at the center of innovation for Chicago. In 1850, People's Gas was the first utility in Chicago to power street lamps with natural gas. In 1871, they contributed significantly to the rebuilding of Chicago after the Great Fire. In 1893, the company shifted to provide residential gas for stoves after the World's Fair Columbia Exposition had proven that electricity would take over street lighting. Today, you might know this company as People Energy Corporation or WEC Energy Group. But gas wasn't the only power play in the area, as there were coal yards. Arguably, the most crucial function came into play in 1887, when two massive grain elevators, the largest in the world at the time, were set up there with the explicit purpose of hoarding grain to enhance demand and in turn increase trade prices. A topic I trust you might recall from our episode about Chicago's famous grain elevators. Anyhow, the nearby railroads and river access meant that Goose Island was a logistic dream come true. And it's funny because when you look at the river today, it seems more like a hassle than a blessing. But you have to remember that with the Erie Canal bringing access to the Atlantic, and the Mississippi bringing access to the Gulf of Mexico, the train connection completed the circle across to the Pacific states. At this point, you might be wondering, with Goose Island being an island, how was it accessed? In modern times, Goose Island is crossed by Division Street running east-west and Halstead Street running north-south. And these are upon some of Chicago's most notable roadways. Hence, if you're a Chicagoan, chances are you've visited Goose Island on many occasions. But let's go back in time to the first road connection, which was provided via Division Street with the construction of a bridge across the river in 1869. The route was extended across the canal side in 1870 so that through traffic could now pass across the island. These original bridges were replaced by more grand bascule bridges around 1904. Actually, the East Division Street Bridge was in fact the second example of the Chicago-style street bridge in existence. And surprisingly, it served the city until 2014 when deterioration proved to render the bridge unsafe. From that time, a temporary bridge has been placed. 
Google Earth provides a view of the new bridge from the perspective of the river, and I must admit, I kind of miss the gritty old Chicago style bridge. This new bridge really feels like a perversion. Now let's take a look at the Halstead Street Bridge, which was installed as far back as 1866 as a swing bridge, but was then replaced by a Scherzer rolling lift bridge in 1897. That bridge served for 58 years, and the existing bridge was completed in 1857. One interesting fact is that this bridge had a temporary control station as the operator houses underwent their final touches. The bridge serving the canal end of the island wouldn't be built until 1874, and unfortunately, the modern version does not open or move. I should also point out that previously, two additional access points existed and have since been removed. One from 1891, an experimental bridge on the canal side linking Weed Street, apparently was Chicago's first attempt at replacing the problematic swing bridges. The Weed Street Bridge was a wooden folding lift bridge, also known as a jackknife bridge, designed by William Harmon. The bridge was so difficult to operate that it was ultimately closed to traffic by 1899 and removed in 1905. The city temporarily used a pontoon swing bridge until that was also removed in 1910. Today, nothing remains of the various bridges from that connection point. Now, although not an access point, Ogden Avenue once passed over the island on a viaduct. This road, named in honor of Chicago's first mayor, deserves its own video. And if you agree, hit that subscribe button. You see, when Ogden Avenue was extended to accommodate traffic on Route 66, a viaduct across Goose Island and the north branch of the Chicago River was created at the expense of $8 million. Planners elected to have the road cross over Goose Island with no exits because some described the land at that time as appalling or as Charles Walker put it, stagnant. And of course, there was a repulsive smell to go along with the unsightly terrain. The York Dispatch reported on December the 10th, 1932, Chicagoans whizzed over the new Ogden Avenue through fair today and saw for the first time a part of their city many of them often had read and heard about but never visited, Goose Island. At one mile in length, the roadway crossed the so-called sluggish backwaters of the Chicago River, and it was for a good cause. This new connection enhanced local prosperity by directly connecting suburban communities like Naperville, Plainfield, and Joliet to the lakefront. So where is this viaduct now? According to Forgotten Chicago, Ogden Avenue's portion that once ran over and east of Goose Island was gradually closed off between the late 1960s and 1990s. This was because Ogden Avenue was underused thanks to the introduction of Chicago's three significant expressways. So the street was closed to traffic between North Avenue to Armitage in 1967. Then another block was removed in 1983 from North Avenue to Blackhawk Street. By 1992, the Bridge Maintenance Division of the Transportation Department was alarmed to discover that chunks of cement were falling from the elevated roadway. Hence the viaduct, not far from Halstead and Division Street, was closed off immediately. Demolition was soon to follow, and apparently the city workers were fired upon from the nearby Caprini Green high-rises, a complex that has also since been removed. The entire viaduct was gone by 1993. With that in mind, I could be reading into things here when looking at the artifacts. Still, when you examine where the Ogden Avenue viaduct would have been at river level on Google Earth, there are some pretty clear signs that a massive structure once interrupted the otherwise steel riverbanks. Anyhow, when you compare maps of Ogden Avenue from the 1960s to today, it's insane to think that such a major city artery can vanish. Another interesting reminder of bygone times is the railroad lift bridge at the island's northern tip. The tracks now disappear at Route 64, facing a modern building. Now, if you look at the other side of that building, you'll see where the tracks continue down to North Kingsbury until they disappear again into a desolate looking lot. Beyond that lot, the tracks reappear and split the branch onto Nursery Street, then once again abruptly end in the modern strip mall, with the left split disappearing in a vacant post-industrial area. According to Curb, these forgotten railroad tracks 
are now being considered by the city as a bike path, which would be a nice nod to City Mayor Ogden, who thought of turning the entire island into a city park at one point. So we've covered the roads and rails, but did you realize that in the 1930s, some believed Goose Island should be considered a location for Chicago's second airport? Allow me to explain. In 1927, Midway International Airport was established and served Chicagoans well, but the distance to downtown proved to be an annoyance. For that reason, many ideas were proposed, such as a second airport at the lakefront or an airport on Goose Island. One piece in the Chicago Tribune from October the 12th, 1934, laid out that concept best, reading, quote, A great deal has been said about the case of the present municipal airport in connection with a project for a new airport on the lakefront. A location that would be ideal has never been considered. Goose Island in the north branch of the Chicago River, stretching from near Chicago Avenue, north to North Avenue. This trek has several industrial and commercial establishments, a small number of families living there, and a substantial amount of vacant real estate. The article continues that real estate values in that section were low because of the nature of the surroundings discouraged speculative buying and selling. But since the cost is always a prominent item in any plan, this section should seriously consider locating an airport closer to the loop and the center of life in a city such as Chicago. This idea didn't garner much support, as on December the 10th, 1948, Miggs Field Airport was opened. By 1955, the same year that O'Hare International Airport opened, it was the busiest single strip airport in the United States, leaving Goose Island as an industrial part of Chicago forever. In the modern day, Goose Island is most famous for the brewery that has embraced its namesake. And perhaps that's a positive thing. After all, its grain silos are gone, rail tracks are abandoned, and bridges connecting it are no longer glorious. So perhaps its legacy as an internationally sought after brand will keep it alive. And we'll wrap it up there for today. Don't miss our Chicago history playlist. And if you'd like to watch these episodes commercial free, click that join button and I'll see you in the members area. Until next time, this is Ryan Sokash signing off.